All right, here we are. There he is. Jacob, what's happening? Not too much, my friend. How are you? I'm I'm very well. Good. Good. Good to be here with you on the old Instagram live coming from your are you a cricket? I'm at cricket, yeah. Yeah. Well, very nice. Fifty degree day today. It's like golf season is I was gonna before. say, how many holes did you get in? I think I had six different people text me today about like going to play this weekend. I'm like, guys, you know there's still gonna be snow on the ground. Gonna be a little snow, gonna be a little sloppy, uh, a little mushy. But yeah, no, I mean, but it is nice. Uh, driving around a little today, I was seeing actually just seeing grass and dirt for the first time in, in I don't know, a month and a half maybe. So right, feels good. Right. Something. Do you practice in the winter? You have like a, a setup. I kind of. Well, here in the golfers, I have a um, I have a hole cut into the floor, which so I, I do I putt a lot. Um, the carpet rolls at about like an eleven, which is, which is nice. Um, but I kind of hang it up in the winter, um, which is something I've always done when I was in high school and when I was younger. Um, I played football. Obviously, you know. Um, <laughs> so, Lineman, yeah, uh, Offense, left tackle, <laughs> tight end, um, and uh, and that was that was fall, right? So I I just was always conditioned to like, um, you know, fall wasn't golf season, but now that and and I did that for a long time, you know, I'd go either fall was either going back to teaching or fall there was always something else, but now I'm trying to play more in the off season. Fall is the best time to play. But my game always dips. I just think I run out of steam for whatever reason. So you think you think too much. That's what we I, all do. I play well, my best I, I, when I haven't yeah. touched a club in four months in the spring. And then the more I play over the course of the season, the worse I get. And then I right? don't touch a club for four months in the winter and the cycle just repeats. So Exactly. So that's the key. Unfortunately, um, you know, with the book the book we'll talk about tonight or any of my books, I tend to play um a little more frequently than that. <laughs> like a, sure. a lot more. So I don't have that luxury of, of forgetting. Um, but it is nice. You had to just go out and say, hey, let's just let's just swing the golf club. So for sure. All right. So let's get started. Well, uh, we're going to try and do this for an hour. Um, I'm going to give you a uh, an honored introduction here. Um, I tried to cut it down to like 10 minutes, but you have a lot of <laughs> it's accomplishments. Hard, man. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll tell, hold on. Let me get my wife to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk as okay. quickly as I can. Um, okay. All right. So introducing our honored guest, Tom Coyne, um, a New York Times bestselling author who's been publishing golf stories since 2001. Um, his first book was A Gentleman's Game, um, a novel named one of the best, sport, best 25 sports books of all time by the Philadelphia Daily News, um, and was then adapted into a feature film uh, with the screenwrite uh, Screen written by Tom himself. Um, his second book, Paper Tiger, An Obsessed Golfer's Quest to Play with the Pros, was released in June 2006 um, and was a summer reading selection in the New York Times. And then we reached the A Course Called Trilogy. Tom's third book, A Course Called Ireland, A Long Walk in Search of a Country, A Pint and the Next Tea, was published in February 2009 and it chronicles his quest to walk and golf all of Ireland. Um, the book was a New York Times, American Booksellers Association, and Barnes and Noble bestseller. Um, and then released in 2018, Tom's much anticipated follow-up, A Course Called Scotland, was an instant New York Times bestseller, and it chronicles Tom's quest to play every Lynx course in Scotland. Thank you for that. Tom's travel trilogy reaches its conclusion with the release of A Course Called America in May of this year, 2021. And that story follows Tom as he plays his way across all 50 states, searching for the great American golf course. Tom is a senior writer and podcast host at the Golfer's Journal and has written for Golf Magazine, Golf Week, Sports Illustrated, New York Times, and other publications. Um, I'm almost done. Um, Tom has an MFA in fiction writing from Notre Dame, where he won the William Mitchell Award for Distinguished Achievement. He lives outside Philadelphia with his wife and two daughters and is an associate professor of English at St. Joseph's University. Tom, go Hawks. Welcome. 
Wow. Jacob, thanks so much for having me. And um, thanks for hitting all the, all the high notes there, all the good stuff. We won't talk about the other stuff. So, no, I'm honored to be here. Um, you told me uh, this was actually my welcome to Philadelphia Cricket Club meeting membership situation. But if I have to answer questions, um, that's fine as well. We can do that, too. That'll be fun. No, I'm psyched to be here. I love cricket and, uh, and I have a lot of good friends there. So um, thank you for, for having me. Great. If you want to just like go to the putting green and roll a couple of putts, I think I can swing that. I can turn it over this way and we can hit some putts. We can do a little putting clinic. Perfect. Um, all right. So just to give everyone out there a little bit of an idea of what to expect and what not to expect. Um, admittedly, I'm not a golf architecture guy and we've talked about this. That's not really going to be the theme of the conversation. Um, I think it's going to be a little more topical, philosophical, talking about your books and your stories. Um, so let me start with this. Um, here at Cricket, um, with everything that we do digitally and on social media, um, you know, we're very passionate about growing the game. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's something that can be done through writing, through photography, videography, social media. Um, and when you and I last spoke, you mentioned, when I brought this up to you, you mentioned the concept, not necessarily of growing the game, but of spreading the game. Mm. So let's start there. Can you talk yeah. about what that means to you as a golf writer? Yeah, there's something, thank you. Um, this, the growing the game initiative, or just the phrase itself, I mean, I, I, I understand it and I applaud it. And as someone tied to the, um, you know, career-wise, <laughs> financially, professionally tied to the success of golf, I'm all for growing the game and there being more golfers and, but there's something about like growing the game almost sounds a little bit sort of like a um, kind of a, a spreadsheet transactional kind of bottom line um, metric, right? Like how many golfers did we have playing? How many this year, how many tee times were paid for? How much, you know, the, those kinds of, um, and those are valuable metrics for sure to sort of judge the health of the, the industry, but does that really talk about and touch on the health of, of where the game is? And so when I was doing my, my travels for a course called America, um, I was meeting a lot of people who wouldn't show up on any of those uh, spreadsheets, who didn't belong to country clubs, um, who didn't, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, financially, where they were in their lives, age-wise, um, or just didn't fit how they played golf. Um, but they were passionate about the game, loved the game, and their, but their participation in it was oftentimes in chat rooms, on Instagram, on Twitter, on social, you know, social media. These are obviously, would, these people would skew a little bit younger. Um, they follow No Lang Up and they're into the Buck Club and, 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 and Zach Blair and, uh, you know, and, and they're, in, they're really into like interesting bespoke merchandise. And, um, you know, that those golfers, uh, when, I, when I started to find them kind of everywhere across the country, um, and there were a lot of them are readers of the Golfer's Journal, which is great. Um, and, you know, and they come out in, in good numbers to sort of meet me at different clubs in different places. And it just gave me this feeling that the game is in a really, really good place. Um, like I said, though, if you looked at an industry report, and the reports are great this year. Golf is all tee times are up across across the board. Our members have noticed. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, everywhere. I mean, this was you know I play at Waynesboro, and this was. Um, I mean, the she was just full from first tee time to last. It was, it was different, but it was great, you know. But these folks that I'm talking about, um, if you'd say like, well, they wouldn't sort of show up in these grow the game initiatives, right? Um, they're, they're kind of exploring their own path and um, their, and their Mecca is Sweeten's Cove down in um, South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. And um, so there is, I wouldn't call it like a golf subculture, but it's, it's just a, it's a different golf culture that is, is exciting and it's, and it's youthful and it's really, really passionate and it's very smart as well. It's really informed. Um, and so I don't know if, uh, so in meeting these folks, it just gave me a lot of like hope and, um, you know, energy for, you know, the future and where golf is going um, versus this notion of, all right, let's get this many clubs into the hands of this many kids by the age of X 
And that way we'll have, you know, this amount of golfers at some point, and then that will lead to such and such number of um, tee times down the line. You know, that, that kind of thing is, is probably less interesting to me. I think anything that makes the game more accessible and, and where you can share it with more people, um, I would say rather than grow the game, I'd say share the game. I would love for more people to have access to golf. You know, the opportunity that I had and this wonderful life that I've had in golf, um, I, and it came from, I got there through as a caddy, uh, and my dad played, but, um, and you know, Philly cricket has such a great caddy culture. I mean, that's essential, but that culture is does not exist everywhere. That's something I certainly found. So I think share the game, um, and, you know, let people sort of take it or leave it. But, um, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a decent way to, to maybe that's sort of the way I might think about it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think it's interesting for me to hear. Um, it's like part of your motivations as a writer um, and as you connect with a lot of people in the golf world, it's a, it's a good way to frame the conversation. Um, yeah. So, so I'm going to jump right into, you know, talking about the new book and, you know, a lot of my questions are going to juxtapose it versus the mm -hmm. last two books you've written. Um, and we're going to stick on motivation for a second. So, yeah. um, you know, you've written a course called Ireland and a course called Scotland. So, Talk to us about the motivation to write a course called America. Um, was it just the logical next step of the travel series? Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm very curious about, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is was there something calling to you to write it now, like at this specific yeah. time in America? Yeah, really good questions. Um, it all boils down to I just did it for the money. I'm in this for the cash, the cash game, Jacob. Um, get Thanks for coming, everybody. That's, that'll do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Amazon.com. Pre-order now. No. Um, I wish that was the case. No, golf has been very, very good to me. But um, the motivations for all, each of the books is, is, has been different. And it's been, a, it's been essential that I kind of put my finger on what and why, you know, what was driving me to sort of do these, uh, take on these quests and undertake these endeavors because they're, they're pretty unreasonable. I mean, it's a course called Ireland, walking around Ireland, you know, the, the entirety of Ireland, 1100 miles um, on foot. And a course called Scotland playing uh, 110 rounds in 57 days. Um, and then a course called America playing 300 rounds in eight months and golfing in all 50 states. And I mean, these, this, this is unhealthy stuff, you know, um, but it's sort of, it's, I have a, a bit of an obsessive personality, so it suits. And I think golf lends itself to, to obsession pretty, I think they, they're, they're good bedfellows. If, if you can really, I love to get just sort of lost in, in my golf and, and getting lost in these trips and these adventures, uh, has been great as well, but I really have to understand why I'm doing them because if they're the kind of trips where if you're like halfway this would be kind of a good idea, or this might be a good book, you're going to get two weeks into it and turn around and go home, right? I mean, there's just too, there's just too much time and money and effort um, to, to build these kind of adventures. So, um, you know, the motivations, the Irish book was, was very much about, you know, discovering Ireland, where my family's from, um, trying to, you know, tell a story about that country in a way that maybe hadn't been, way it hadn't been explored before. And I was very passionate about that. A course called Scotland was, you know, I, I definitely wanted to sort of, I was looking for the secret to golf. It's something I've been looking for my entire life, you know, an answer, um, a fix uh, to really make sense of, of what it was about golf that, um, that it created this sort of, created this obsession, this, this connection for me. Um, and it had to exist in Scotland. And if it, if it was in Scotland, it was going to be a links and I had to go to all of them. So um, that became, it took a while for me to understand my angle on Scotland. But once I decided, I'll, you know, I'm going to find the, the secret to golf. Um, I was 110% into that story. And then with a course called America, um, you know, it got to the point, it, there seemed a logical trilogy to doing Ireland, Scotland and America when it comes to golf. But it really came down to the fact that I didn't know my country very well. You know, I had, I knew Ireland and Scotland a whole lot better golf wise and otherwise too, because I'd actually had to do research about Scotland and Ireland and learn the cultures and, and immerse myself in every part of, of each country. And I hadn't really golfed west of the Mississippi, you know, in, in America. 
I'm from Philly and I, I, yeah, I played all over the section and you want for nothing here. We've got such great golf. Right. Um, and then finally my friend joined Philly cricket. So I got to play there too. So, um, so I was, I was in good shape. I didn't need to go anywhere. Right. But I needed to explore and I needed to get to know my con my own country. And so the story is the search for the great American golf course, which means, which required me to find out what is a great golf course, but also to find out what is an American golf course. What in 2019 does that word, which is when I did my trip, does that word really mean? And I can guess from my couch in Philadelphia, but I don't know what life's like in New Mexico or Colorado or Alaska. And that was the thing that made me really get off my butt and say, I want to do this. I want to know America and golf was a great way to go explore it. So following up on that, right. So like compared to Scotland and Ireland, America is, is wondrous in its breadth, its diversity, its variety of people, of ideals, of landscapes, yeah. of what makes something great. Um, and you know, golf in Philadelphia is probably fairly different than golf on the West Coast or in the Pacific Northwest or in the mm -hmm. Midwest, um, both in the types of courses that you'll play and the type of people that you'll meet. So I'm curious, you know, what was your approach to golf in America as a singular concept? Yeah, so I knew right off the bat, I mean, this was of, of all the trips or anything I planned or undertaken as a writer, as a golfer, I mean, this was the one that was closest to never happening because it was, like you said, I mean, Ireland and Scotland, they're the size, Ireland's the size of Indiana. Um, Scotland wouldn't be a whole lot bigger. I don't actually know if it would be. So um, the, just the undertaking of it, there were just any number of times where I told my wife, like, I can't do this. It's too big. Like there's too much. There's, there's too many golf courses I have to see. I remember, um, you know, in first crowdsourcing, suggestions for courses that I had to go to, you know, said, Hey, send me, you know, just going on social media and saying, send me, you know, the course that to you seems like the quintessential American golf course. I can only imagine how many responses. I got 800 <laughs> emails, 800. <laughs> right. And I'm not that, I'm not that cool. And I'm not that, I'm not, I don't have that many followers right. on social. So <laughs> it was like, everyone had their opinion and they were passionate opinions too. And it was like, if you miss this course, your journey is in vain, you know? So <laughs> So I just started, you know, so I put, put them all into a spreadsheet. I started to kind of whittle that down and, and, and just worked my way down to some number that, you know, I felt, okay, 300 is still pretty unreasonable given the time that I was giving myself. But at least that way, um, you know, trying to blend the mix of, okay, I want to play some top 100 courses. I want to play um, a, a good number of public accessible golf courses. I want to play nine holers. I want to play short courses. Um, courses that, you know, not just the 18 hole template, because that is sort of something, a, a trend you certainly see um, in, in golf course architecture or, in, you know, in golf in general is courses, shorter courses, courses with different numbers of holes, things like that. So I wanted to play plenty of those. I wanted to have like the off the wall golf experiences, sand greens or playing mud greens or playing, you know, um, so trying to sort of fit that all together, um, and keep a balance between private and public. And, um, and then along the way, I said, well, I want to tell the history of golf in America. So a way to do that was, all right, if I visit every U S open venue along the way, since I'm going to all 50 States, like, why not? Why not? So am I going to have the chance to do that? I will, you know, the story of the USGA and, the, and, and where the, how the open comes about and the history of the, of the U S open, um, that's going to cover a good chunk of the history of golf in America. I mean, there's going to be a lot of other parts to fill in, which and other places to visit, but they, so the, the open venues became sort of tent poles, which, um, which was great to have that gave me some sort of organizational framework to work with. Um, but you know, it was, it was a challenge. Um, and you know, it was great and fun work to do to try and, boil it all into into one into one trip um but it there were plenty of moments where i thought you know i'm not going to be able to to pull this off and, and visit um to do this the way that it should be done because like you said there's so many different the types and, and kinds of golf and so many different 
I didn't really know what to to expect. I followed people's leads on like, okay, you need to check out this little weird nine hole or this public course. And if I got a couple people saying the same course, I'd say, all right, I definitely have to go there. So I just got a lot of help from people. And then when I'd be somewhere, I'd take advice and say, well, it's, oh, you got to go check that out. So I, you know, I've learned through the process of doing these is, is listening to the people that get put in my way um, in, a, in a good way that, that end up, you know, becoming a part of my life on these trips and they, they haven't steered me wrong yet. So good. Good. Um, all right. Before my next question, just for everybody following, if you want to ask a question, we'll get to some questions at the end. There's a question mark button at the bottom of the screen. Just tap that, put your question in there um, and then click submit and then wait until the end. Um, all right. So you mentioned earlier a little bit about having this obsessive quality. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, what could be more obsessive than golf and writing, right? Yeah. You figured it out. <laughs> you found the two things <laughs> that, uh, that are perfect for an obsessive person. So um, as you found yourself traveling through the country and playing all these, you know, 300 rounds and, you know, what was the string? Like, wh what was the obsession? What became the obsession in this book? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think a good part of it became like, you know, something that I knew setting out that I wanted to try and find the great American golf course, right? So that meant I was going to have to sample this wide smorgasbord of, of golf. And, um, and that was, that was taking me to some pretty wild places that, you know, to you know, to the edges of, of Texas down to Lajitas because someone said, hey, you've got to have this experience where you can actually drive a ball into Mexico or go up to Maine where you can drive a ball into Canada or <laughs> from Canada actually back into America. Um, and these, you know, someone sharing those experiences to a golf obsessive to someone who is always after that next exciting experience. One, because I'm personally into it, but two, as a writer, I'm on the lookout for those experiences to share with my readers, right? To give them you know, some value and, and something to give them something they haven't seen before. Um, so that, you know, that became, it became clear pretty quickly that there was going to be a lot of opportunities to find things in America that obviously I didn't know were there, that I didn't know were so interesting, that felt like going to another country, that were things that we should be celebrating in places we should be going in our own country, rather than always, you know, flying somewhere else to go play golf. So you know, I, I think the obsession sort of became, all right, let's find the next great American story. You know, it, it was initially like, all right, I want to find the next great American golf the, or the great American golf course. But um, it really became about like, I'm, I'm meeting so many great people. I can't wait to meet the next fascinating person that's going to bump into me or be carrying my bag or that I'm going to meet at dinner or something, you know, um, because, you know, living on the road like that, the road, um, you know, in a different hotel every night for eight months. And the road takes care of you. Like it, it, it just, it puts like, you know, some not so great people in your path, but I was really blessed. Uh, I just found so many interesting people with stuff to share who'd been through things that, um, things of, of real significance in their lives. And, you know, they just came into my life and I had the chance to just capture and try and tell their story. And, so it was, it really became the search for the great American story. And uh, I think I, I grabbed a couple of them on the way. That's great. Um, I want to stick with the people that you meet on the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if I, you know, when I first wrote this question, it was, you know, when, when you were traveling through Scotland, through Ireland, and then through the US, you know, what were the similarities in the people that you came across? Um, but I, I'm going to instead ask about the differences. Um, yeah. I want to know, you know, as you're traveling through Scotland, Ireland, and then the U.S., as you met people on the road, what was the biggest difference that you noticed um, as a theme? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I could do a long talk about the difference between just the Scots and the Irish, for sure, because um, <laughs> they're subtle. But, they're but we're there. Americans, so we want to hear about ourselves. So Right now, for sure. <laughs> Let's exactly. focus on that. Yeah. Um, well, the thing, it's funny, like with a Scottish and an Irish golf trip, like both have great links, golf courses, they're great experiences. A, a, a golf trip to Ireland tends to be more centered on fun, or as they call it, the crack in Ireland. So 
Um, and that's, I think that's reflected in the people as well. They're just really fun. They're just up for a laugh. They're, they're, um, there's a sort of carefree nature to them, um, up for a conversation. And the Scots are a good time as well. I mean, they're, they're, they're a fun, you know, outgoing people as well. They can, I, I found they could be a slightly, a little bit more reserved. Um, they're British, you know, it would de also depend on where you were in Scotland, the Highlands versus, you know, being in and around Edinburgh or whatever. So there's a little bit of that propriety associated sometimes, um, on the golf scene in Scotland. But once you kind of pierce that, um, it's a lot of laughs, but, and they're, I would say they're also probably a little more, even more competitive at their golf and take it a, a touch more seriously, uh, where the Irish aren't afraid to be a little more irreverent and it's about the fun. And then to compare that to my experience in America, um, you know, it really was, it was like state to state. And that was one of the, the joys and the exciting parts of, of traveling, like going to Maine, meeting my first like Mainers and learning about, um, learning what a, uh, you know, you know, where to get the lobster and, and, and all these, um, what was the name for the lobster restaurants? Um, the, uh, I mean, that was just a great experience and they had a sort of almost felt like kind of Scottish, um, exterior that was a little tougher to pierce, but, um, it was like, Hey, we're glad you're here. When are you going home? Um, <laughs> you're like, we love, we love it up here, but it's our place. Right. And then, classic um, New England, just bad. Right. By yeah. The cold. So <laughs> there was a little bit of that by, by the cold. Totally. So that was interesting. And then to get to know like the, the, you know, just the different vibe in, in every state, you know, to go to Oregon and, and soak up that vibe. It's like, that's a hard one to leave. Um, the place is just perfect. Um, it cuts both ways though in Oregon. Oregon's funny. Like it's just this free, it's free, you know, it's like micro brews and pots legal and great golf and live your life. And, you know, just this sort of real libertarian vibe that is very, um, it's very just chill, you know, but then at the same time, there's also a lot of people like stocking guns up in the Hills for, uh, <laughs> getting ready for the next revolution too. So <laughs> Oregon's a little bit complicated, I guess, when you look at it as a whole, I drove past some really interesting uh, rallies, if you will, but to get that whole picture and like sort of see the nuances and the different personalities, it was nice to see that in America, we still had so many different personalities, right? Because you can, there was this, I, I felt like I might be just driving out into this one vast strip mall. And granted, you can go to Outback Steakhouse in 50 states. Right. True. Right. But it was a better shape. It was a lot more diverse and interesting probably than I expected. And thank goodness it gave me a lot to write about. Right. Of course. So I have to ask then, um, you've, can you, you got to give us a, like a couple of examples of some of the wildest, um, the wildest courses that you saw, yeah. some of the wildest experiences. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, the really wild ones, um, playing sand green golf in Missouri uh, was awesome. Um, there's two Kansas cities, which is, you know, Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, which was confusing. Right. So this one was in, this was in Miss, Miss, Missouri. I better check that because I have to send the final copy of the book off tomorrow. <laughs> um, but playing sand green golf, which used to be like a big deal in, in the Plains in, in Missouri, um, where communities essentially would cost, it cost zero to maintain the golf course because you didn't have to cut, you didn't even have to mow the greens. So I went to this golf course that didn't have electricity or running water. So talk about like a lot, you know, we talk about like, you know, less inputs in our golf courses. They didn't have a choice. Like there's no <laughs> right. way to have an input. The only input they had was on the sand. They, so they'd have, the greens were just circles of sand and wherever your ball hit, you know, and it would, that's stunned. <laughs> No problem getting the old Titleist to stop on the sand greens. <laughs> you just take, you take a string from the, hole, from the pole in the middle, which was the hole, and measure how far out your ball was, and then go over to the, there'd be one smooth path, right? Um, that they would, that was actually almost like kind of crusty. Um, and you would, you know, fr so that would mark your distance from the hole and you'd putt from there. So that was just really wild. And it, and they told me, the the person the gentleman at the course wouldn't admit to this but i was told that it was french fry grease is what kept sand greens pure 
So, you know, you're getting something to do with the French fry grease and you don't have to have any inputs or even mow the grass because you just, you know, um, you just play in the field and the fairways are rough and it was just great. That was awesome. And then going to the Navajo Nation and playing a homemade reservation golf course. Um, I mean, that was just so incredibly meaningful and wonderful. And, you know, I, I show up in my golf spikes and um, that's the first thing they tell me, like, you can't wear those here because the greens or the browns are, are dried mud. No, no spikes. You'll ruin the greens. And uh, so it's like, you know, put your sneakers back on, which is, which is certainly was my first time ever being told to do that at a golf course. Um, and just go out and watch, you know, and experience what a handful of, of people in the Navajo community built for the kids there and have never charged anyone to play their golf course. And when they have, it's a nine hole course. And when they have their annual tournament, they have to turn people away. They get, they get people coming from all over to, to play this little nine holder called Lonesome Trail, um, Wagon Trail to Lonesome Pine. It's a great name for a golf course too. <laughs> it doesn't really fit very well in the sweater, but it's, it's a good name. I mean, that was crazy, you know, and, and I played, I went to Alaska for the summer solstice and, and I played golf through the night, um, you know, teed off at 11 o'clock and uh, in a fivesome and play and the sun never set on us and, you know, played the northernmost golf course in, in the United States. And what a trip that was. It was weird. <laughs> I, I mean, I went to Alaska for like 36 hours, flew home, teed off in the, um, you know, flew for a day to get home and then teed off in my club championship. It wasn't, um, I don't have to tell you the result there. It wasn't, no, it wasn't that's what it. I was hoping for, but, <laughs> um, you know, it was just, just great. But every time what made the experience is great. And this is like, it almost feels cliche to say it, but it's, it's always the people, you know, um, and golf giving me four to six hours, depending before and after, to spend is just the right amount of time, I think, to find out enough of somebody's story um, to turn it in, you know, to, to capture enough of it for, for the book. So, thank, you know, that's what golf does so well. It just it puts us together and in a common pursuit and gives us just enough time to, to, to find what's interesting about one another. Amen. Amen. Um, so I'm curious, after having all of these you know, all these experiences. Um, and then you come back home and you go play at your local, you know, at Waynesboro, at mm -hmm. your club. Like, what's that experience like? Are you, are you happy to be back? Or is it like a week later and you're like, all right, I've played Waynesboro like three times now. Like, I need to <laughs> like find, yeah. find another way to have fun. Like, I'm bored. It's you know? weird, right? Because it's, it's actually kind of humbling because this happened a couple times on the trip. Right. So I go and I play in Alaska and we played it from like 7,300 yards and we're playing in the middle of the night and I, I played really well and I shot like one over. I'm like, I'm going to go back to Waynesboro. I'm going to shoot 58. Right. You know, <laughs> like, cause I know that golf course this right. is my home course and I'm playing a new golf course every day, different conditions, different kinds of greens. And I was scoring relatively well, like once in a while I'd throw in like around par. And, and that was, so in the back of my head, I'm like, man, I'm just going to tear it up when I go home. And I, I do that when I go to Ireland and Scotland too, because, you know, links courses can really be, especially the winds up can be just extraordinarily demanding. And I'm like, man, I can't wait to go back to Waynesboro with no wind. And it's just going to look like a big driving range. I'm just going to crush it. And I never do. I feel it's like I know golf. this story is going to You know, like you don't. Golf just doesn't allow that to happen. It makes sense. I, you should be able to go to your home course and play better than you do with these other places. But um, I think going to somewhere maybe where, I'm overconfident or I'm not as focused or I'm not as engaged because I've been there so many times versus I think sometimes going to a new course and playing for the first time, um, all your senses are on kind of high alert. Um, you're probably paying attention to things that maybe you don't pay attention to at home. You're also not maybe as fearful or you're not playing three holes ahead. Like at Waynesboro, if I make a bogey on two, I know I've got to make a birdie on six or, or seven, you know? So it's like, you know, like I've got I'm doing all the math in my head as I'm playing. And when I don't know the golf course and I'm playing one hole at a time, that's how we're supposed to play. Right. Yeah. I, I had a shrink once who told me that. So, so, so I'm curious, um, you're playing all these courses for the first time and, and mm -hmm. 
I'm sure many of them for the first time. How much research do you do before you play it? Like, are you, are you looking yeah. at hole by hole pictures and how to hit, you know, where to hit your drive and how to play the hole? Or you go into it a little more just like, let's see how it goes. <laughs> it's a little bit of a mix. I mean, the, the schedule didn't allow in America, didn't allow for, um, for too much advanced research. The research I would do was like, who won the US Open here? Was there a shot on a particular hole that I need to pay attention to, take notes on, get pictures of, you know, like what, what, what are the moments in terms of research on how to play particular golf holes? Those were few and far between, you know, where, okay. And, and that was really just because of history too. Cause I remember, all right, this is where Bobby Jones did X and, right. uh, or this is where so-and-so, you know, this is where he hit it off the lily pads and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, no. I, I didn't do a lot and, and I don't, and I didn't do it and, right. and, and play better. Right. Like I didn't <laughs> right. overthink it. And I do the same thing in Scotland and Ireland. Like I'd always buy those yardage books because they're good souvenirs and never look at it. Right. <laughs> and I have, I have like boxes and boxes of these things. And um, they're great to go through and remember holes. And they're important for my research. Like when I'm writing the book to remember what the fourth hole was or right. something, but I don't ever look at those things while I'm playing. Um, I just like to look at the shot in front of me. And if it's a great golf course, and I think I'm, just about every one I played was a great golf course. It'll see, I think it'll kind of, you know, suggest either the shot you want to hit or where you want to hit it, you know, um, at least they'll give you enough of a, a little bit of a wink. So I like to kind of just stay in tune to that. All right. So this question was obviously coming. Um, so you've played cricket several times and yeah. you have a good appreci appreciation of, you know, the cricket club experience. Um, how does PCC fit into golf in America? It fits in mightily. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a good chunk of the story. I'd say of all the Philly courses, I think your members will be pleased, um, to, you know, because of the U S open courses here, Philly country, Philly cricket, Marion. Um, I do a, a good treatment on Cobbs too, because of the history there and what's going on there currently. Um, but cricket's a, a good gets a, a good few pages for I like to hear that. <laughs> any any number of reasons. Well, I mean, being the first country club, right? And I think that whole I, I spend some time going into, you know, where the American country club, how it comes about and why essentially to sort of explain why golf in Scotland and Ireland or in the British Isles is treated and handled and organized differently than it is over here, right? Um, where you have over there, you have golfing societies that would be attached to this course and then later attached to another one. And then the societies would move around, you know, um, or a number of clubs sharing one golf course or multiple golf courses like at St. Andrews or Carnoustie or, or, or um, Montrose or anywhere, any, you know, any number of places. Um, there's a sort of separation between club and course over there that just goes back to the way golf was like the field itself is considered public property, but the club is the exclusive thing. Right. But over here, golf, you know, the country club develops, you know, in the 19th century, originally around other games, notably cricket. Right. Uh, cricket, equestrian, uh, different equestrian sports, hunting, you know, whatever. Uh, polo was, was big um, on the country club scene. And golf actually came a little later, right? Like it was like, and certainly for cricket, it would have been a later edition. Right. We had uh, tennis for game. 10 years before we had, before we built our golf course. Exactly. And so you're like in the year, so you're in the 19th century, America's going through all this upheaval and change. And there's a, you know, a portion of society wants to like play these, um, still play these games and celebrate, um, you know, that, that culture, you know, that's mostly associated with, with, British with being British, um, these, these sort of English games, if you will. Um, and so golf comes along toward, it's probably the last one to get sort of pulled into the, to the country club scene, but it eventually does. And at that point, country clubs are, you know, their own, um, you know, their, their own entities, their private entities. So golf becomes, um, for the most part in America, a private endeavor, um, with, you know, some conspicuous efforts at places like Cobbs Creek, um, you know, to, to, or at, um, Van Cortland in the Bronx, you know, to uh, to have some public outlets for golf. But in any event, that's a long way of saying that Philly cricket's history, its role, and it's 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 the part it plays in golf. 
and I love the the story of where your 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 colors come from and the 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 original you know your um the original cricket players from Penn and the and the Gypsies and the cricket team and all that stuff. I think that stuff is fascinating. So that all that's all in the book because that's gold. Like for a writer, it's like ooh, a cricket team called the Gypsies. That's where they got their colors from on the right. flag you see everywhere. Like that's money. People love that stuff versus like. Well, I hit another five iron right down the middle and I got a great bounce. Right. Who cares? You right. know, like they want to hear, they want to hear scoops. Totally. It's funny that you bring up Van Cortland. I bet uh, anyone who knows me, who's uh, following, uh, you know, who's, who's tuned into this right now might be surprised. After cricket, Van Cortland is the place I've played the most golf in my life. <laughs> I, I mean, and, like, I'll, and I'll play great. I'll card a great number. And I have to remind myself that it's like a 5,200 yard course. <laughs> Um, you got to know. Hey, it's you sneaky. Got, hey, you you got to know. You got to know. What you got to know because I had a tough. I went there in the book because it's the oldest public golf course in America, and played with a couple of buddies. I mean, this is a great example of you know I played with um, uh, Lenny and Jimmy from the Bronx, right? And who I just met through email, and Jimmy's a doorman in Manhattan. But Lenny's like a town manager on Long Island, and uh, or in the boroughs, where, wherever he was, um, but. You know, they become these good buddies. We have this great day. An Irish guy from Dublin, a banker, joins us at Van Cortland. By the time we leave, we're all best friends. We've kept in touch the whole time. And they're all coming to the book launch at Rolling Green in May. Awesome. And I, I'm just like, it's so great. And, you know, and Van Cortland, yeah. But it's so hard there, not in terms of difficult, like in terms of like concrete. <laughs> I mean, I was hitting like balls into green that were boom, gone, you know. So, and 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 when you're... They don't. Uh, they don't thin the uh, the woods out at Van Cortland. So no, it's, not it's so much. Challenging get, enough. Uh, <laughs> half of my golf balls that I get, I buy from a guy who collects balls on the other side of the chain link fence and like sells them through a hole in the fence. I'm like oh, yeah. five dollars. I mean, this is my guy. So that's where totally. I get. That's where I get half my golf balls. Fun Always. fact about Van Cortland. Do you know what film was uh, upstairs in the clubhouse? Wall Street, the locker room in Wall Street, where Michael Douglas fixes his hair in three quick strokes as he's talking uh, to young Charlie Street, Charlie Sheen. Well, I should say Gordon Gecko. Um, the locker room at the, uh, at the racket club in wall street is the upstairs locker room at Van Cortland in the Bronx. I love that. Which if you yeah. go in now, is just like spike not so nice. everywhere. And just like, yeah. it's seen. They it's gussied seen it up for the movie. Years, right. Yeah. That um, was great. All right. So, um, I'm gonna... there's Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, all right. Last question. And then we have a lot of questions from, uh, you know, from folks who turned in, who've tuned in. So I want to get to as many of those as we can here. Um, personal question. Um, you've, you've talked before about how, about your personal growth from writing your previous books. Mm -hmm. um, how did you grow from writing this book um, in a way maybe that was different from your growth after the last two? Yeah, I think, you know, Ireland was a, a young man's, um, it was kind of a party. I'll be honest. It was, I was, I didn't have kids. Um, it was dangerous doing it that way, but I didn't really care. Um, and, and that was, so I think I grew up a little bit with that book. I grew up a lot in the Scotland book and it was important to me coming out of like some things in my personal life. Like that trip gave me a lot of, um, doing that story kind of brought me back to golf, it brought me back to golf writing. It, it brought back, you know, um, a confidence that might've been, been shaken there for a while. And I think that, you know, that process continued um, with a course called America. But I, I think the thing that probably um, in terms of personal growth, um, I, these trips, I mean, I'm the, I'm the central character in these trips by necessity. They're, they're, they're my adventures. But it was in, on this adventure, this journey, where I really became aware of how unimportant I am to the story in a good way. Um, how it doesn't all revolve around me. Um, how the, you know, um, that it's so much more about the people that I'm meeting and their stories um, that I, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I do this. Right. It, it just became clear to me. Like I just kept finding so many fascinating people where it's like, 
why am I meeting? Like, why did my, why is my caddy a cancer survivor? You know, this 12 year old kid, you know, why am I playing golf in the Navajo nation with a bus driver who decorates his school bus with pictures of kids who have made it off the reservation to inspire kids. You know, like, I'm just like, this is about your story. And I am here to just cap. I've got a pen. Right. And, and that's made me um, really kind of even, I think have a sharper focus about what it is that I do and, and really um, uh, be grateful for it. Awesome. I'm, I'm like, selfishly i have no interest in clicking on the question mark and like letting other people ask questions because <laughs> i have so many questions more questions i want to ask but that's probably not the right thing to do um so let's see what we got um greg thompson if you could pick one place to live in the u.s based on the type of golf you enjoy what would it be kenosha greg um no i think uh, i think that's greg from kenosha there coming through loud and clear if, if in terms of the golf that I enjoy, one place to live. Ooh, I'm going to go with the Hamptons. And I'm going to, I mean, this is like a fantasy, right? <laughs> right. So I get to um, spend my days bouncing around between Maidstone and National and Shinnecock. Just that seaside. I mean, those whether they're pure links or not, who cares? Um, that firm and fast seaside golf, windy in that setting. Um, it's golf heaven. And it was hard as a Philly guy to give Long Island its, its credit, its due, you know, because there's always this like Philly section versus the, the Metro, the Met section um, kind of thing. But, you know, once I explored Long Island, I'm like, there's no better golf collection in, in terms of for, by square foot or square mile probably anywhere in the planet. It's, right. it's just really, 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 really good. <laughs> All right. Outside the cut, biggest surprise and biggest disappointment on the trip. <laughs> biggest disappointment. I'll tell you what the biggest disappointment was. Going to Whistling Straits and on the 18th hole, not the course, the course is, is, a, is a beast. It's, it's, it's um, I mean, talk about like, paying a fair amount of money to go get your butt kicked right right but it's so beautiful like you gotta you gotta do it but on the straights course going to the straights and going to, on 18 i'd tell my caddy all right where's the dustin johnson bunker right so i want to i want to go ground my club um and they filled it in because it was slowing down play because everyone was going <laughs> to take pictures in the dustin johnson bunker right. Um, man, there were, there was probably a surprise every day, but the best surprise was, um, the course that I think, yeah, the course that, be that becomes the great, um, in my estimation is the great American golf course. If everyone, now, I can't promise, tell you if everyone promises, the, yeah, now to buy the all book, whoever this us. is, everyone keep this amongst yourselves. I'm going to tell you the, no, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't, you got, you got to buy the book, preferably in hardcover. Um, preferably in multiples of two, um, two to three. Uh, and then it will come, then you'll find out. Um, the more you buy, the quicker you find out. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Stephen Brannon, what advice do you give a person who wants to become a better storyteller? Ah, um, that's a good one. Um, cause in my other life, as you mentioned, I, I was just teaching storytelling today at, at, at St. Joseph's. Um, I think the best advice I can give is the most, probably the most obvious, but sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I have students who want to be writers and I ask them what they read. Um, and I'm not talking just at St. Joe's, but anywhere. Um, and they're like, well, I'm not a big, big reader, but I, I really love to write. Um, the only way to learn to tell stories, in my opinion, or to, to learn to, to write is to, is to read and, and to read in a greedy way. Um, read not for I like or I didn't like or, um, you, know, this, you know, this book was exciting or it wasn't exciting. Read for, find a book that like turns you on and like try and figure out how the writer did it. You know, what do they do? Like literally to the point, like what do they do in their sentences, you know? how they organize their paragraphs, that stuff. I mean, 
there were writers for me it was like writers like Raymond Carver and Tim O'Brien not golf writers um who really um made me want to write because I just love their sentences so and then for figuring out story from there um again it's it's uh it's a matter of seeing how um other great storytellers other great storytellers do it there's no uh, as i say good artists borrow and great artists steal and so see how other folks do it and then do it your way right one of the um i've always been you know pretty voracious reader and my reading taste has evolved over the years but like when i was younger i read a lot of like quippy writing right and rick riley you know what was like the gold standard of you know mm -hmm quippy sports writing. And I will always remember him saying that he tries to write sentences that people have never seen before. And that's always stuck with me. Um, that's a bold, um, yeah, and that's a great ambition. It would be hard, it's hard to do. But as <laughs> right. long, if you're trying to do that, you're at least, you're at least gonna come up with something interesting. Right. Um, all right, let's see. We have a uh, favorite clubhouse. Hmm. Favorite clubhouse. Yeah, that's from uh, Peach Bart, PJ Bartholomew, one of our students, cricket club members. <sighs> Favorite clubhouse. Gosh, they all have such different character, like modern, old. Chicago Golf Club. Let me just name drop a little bit there. Chicago Golf is like so unique and like severe and and spartan and cool I, I just i just love that um that was that was a great spot uh clubhouses i mean myopia hunts is so charm i mean what a charm where that one is um you've got a good one at philly uh cricket for sure um marion's a great one uh man cow club was hard to get out of that one that was that was pretty great um man uh, I know I'm like missing so, so many. Hold on, because this is a really good question. Um, you know what was really cool? Was the, the clubhouse, what we did at Yeamans Hall down in Charleston. I played with a seasonal member and the clubhouse, so the clubhouse, when the, when the winter, when the members aren't there, because they all go down there during, during the winter on their way to Florida, they allow, um, and Yemen's is like impossible to, it, you know, it's all old family, old money, old, et cetera. But they have this great scheme that allows like local seasonal members to join like summer members and, and play while, while nobody's there. And so for their clubhouse, there's a, uh, it's just, the, it's in the pro shop, like right next to the pro shop, there's like a kegerator and a couple tables and like some pair of, and like a couple things you can buy and that's their clubhouse. <laughs> um, and I just thought, this is awesome. Like, this is just all you need. It was very Scottish in that sense. It was very utilitarian. And that appeals to me, like smaller is better. Like Cypress's clubhouse is just useful. You know, it's not, right. it's not anything but, but just, uh, but handy. And, a drink, and that's a table great. and somebody to talk to, right? That's it. Right. And, and, and it's out there at places like, the Dunes Club in Michigan. Kaiser did a great job there with the little tiny, you know, intimate clubhouse. And um, man, I could do a whole book just on clubhouses. <laughs> um, all right. I don't care about everybody else. I have another question I want to ask. Um, it's good for you. Thank you. Um, so totally changing courses to um, Paper Tiger. Because um, I just, you know, I was like so fascinated by that whole story mm -hmm. and, um and your goals and your ambitious goals there. And my question is, did you, how did your experiences writing that book shape the way that you watch and follow and generally, generally like interact with pro golf today? And do you think that your experiences with that book like pushed you more towards amateur golf and amateur golfers for like the rest of your writing? Yeah, good question. So it definitely changed like everything for me because the point, like before Paper Tiger, I did A Gentleman's Game, which was a novel about caddies because I grew up caddying. Right. And it was Paper Tiger that really got me into like capital G golf and to where it was really kicking the tires and looking under the hood and whatever metaphor you want to use, looking really closely at um, next level golf, um, what it took to play at the next level, studying the golf swing, um, all the sort of, you know, studying equipment. It's where I really became a golf 
geek. I mean, it was, I was a golf nut, but in that book, I've become a golf geek. And, and I've been one ever since, you know, I, I can get, still get geeky about talking about, you know, fittings, driver fittings or, or, um, you know, um, shaft combinations and just stuff that's not that interesting that I somehow find interesting <laughs> still that, that are from my paper tiger days and the education I had with like Dr. Jim Suddy and um, at the time, you know, working really doing a lot of work with Mizuno and, and just that, that whole education. So a lot of that stayed with me. And um, but one thing that had stayed with me the most from that book is, you know, how many damn good golfers are out there. And that to me, um, it was very humbling but uh, but inspiring as well, because, you know, you have a ton of good players at, at cricket. So so, you know, you all know, you know, how, how many good players are are out there. But, you know, I was kind of bouncing around at Monday qualifiers, you know, and mini tour stuff. And um, and there were just so many extraordinarily gifted golfers who nobody was ever going to know their name. Uh, it was just there just wasn't enough room at the top for, for anyone to know who they were maybe one or two would slip through. So yeah, that certainly changed my, my view of golf to realize that the P like, I think sometimes people maybe who aren't golfers look at golf and say the PGA tour and they say, that's golf. It's a tiny little slice of it. Just a right. tiny, tiny slice of it. There's a very entertaining slice of it, a very dramatic one, but it isn't golf. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a fun part of it. Um, and that's, you know, we could go off on the distance debate too, et cetera. But, you know, that's what kind of drives me crazy about that is that like everyone sits around and debates all this distance stuff. It applies to 0.01% of golfers. I didn't play any golf course in a course called America where I thought like, man, I wish I didn't hit it so far. You know, it didn't happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm still a golf geek, paper tiger golf geek. All right. Um, all right last question. And then, you know, we'll hit an hour and. Um, I really appreciate all of your time and taking the time to do oh, this. No, I'm, it's been this awesome. This is so fun. Yeah. Um, what's what's next? See if my wife's listening. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I'm going to play another 300 rounds in eight months <sighs> next year. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. It's funny, like, the stories, um, people are asking, like, how'd you get away with, like, or, you have to I'm glad you, everyone, the first question I usually get is how are you still married? So I appreciate you not leading with that. But the we answer can, we can be, see we can go. how great you are. So that's, you know. <laughs> see, exactly. That's what I, isn't it obvious? That's right. Um, but it's like, well, when you do something like paper tiger and you play golf 542 days in a row, you're setting like the bad husband bar in a really good place. Like you like to be, to do worse, more damage than that. You really have have to try. And I, I, I've tried. <laughs> um so um so am i going to do it but it does feel like it's time um this is a nice trilogy that it, i think they work together they complement one another um i say that's so immodest it's a very nice trilogy um it's a very nice trilogy. no but it's a very nice trilogy no it just it just kind of works america scotland and ireland and the countries they're tied together and the way i can reference it I haven't done Australia, New Zealand. I've been there and played like a couple rounds of golf and paper tiger, but that would be the, the place left. That's the, le that's the hole left in my resume. Um, if I can find a way to do it, I'm not sure if it's a book or if it's a, um, uh, something for the golfers journal or, or, or what, but maybe, I mean, so maybe down under, honestly, I started this, this takes us back to the beginning gentleman's game. I got into this as a fiction writer and I'd love to, I'd love to write another novel. Um, and my wife would love that too, because the funny, you get to just make stuff up. You don't have to go, you don't have to go to Alaska to find a good story. You can just pretend everyone's playing golf at midnight. Right. Which is fun. Right. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, you have, uh, you have a lot of potential readers um, watching now and we're, we'll post this on our channel. So people who didn't tune in now can see it. And um, I'm sure plenty of people will and can't wait to read the book, truly. Awesome, Jacob. Thank you. Yeah, folks are interested. You can follow me. Well, I'm here at Coin Writer, and May 25th is the big day. You can pre-order it now wherever you get books. I've got to make my sales pitch. Check it out. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll Jacob, get I really... out the, uh, the Cricket Club credit card. We'll do some damage. There you go. Let's go. It should be, uh, it'll be the, the member gift, the tea gift this year for the member guests. Um, I like it. 
No, Jacob, I really, uh, I, I appreciate it. This has been fun. Thanks again, Tom. Have a good All night. Right. Be well. Take you care. Too.